last part of my PhD, which looked at the local, evolution of locomotion in mucus of kind of crocodiles. Uh, I'll be walking you through a series of analysis of shape and stress, hopefully showing you how these can inform our ideas of how these crocodiles lived and moved about over the last 50 so million years, but obviously you gave a bit of an introduction in order for people who don't know what I'm talking about. Um, the mucus of were Australia's own endemic radiation of the crocodiles, separate from salt and freshwater crocodiles, uh, uh, following the KT extinction, which uh, hopefully everyone here knows led to the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs and very much set the stage for Earth's modern mammal and bird-dominated forms. Now, when we look at crocodiles, we see a sibling lineage to the dinosaurs that was a lot more morphologically complex than people tend to give it credit for, living fossils and all that. Uh, the problem is, is that only a fraction of this diversity has actually survived down to us today, which is three groups are uh, still alive, the gharials, the true crocodiles, and the gators. And we still have still a lot of questions about how this community actually came about. Now, the mucosupines, just to put them on, uh, were probably one of the more successful of these latter-day survivals. If things hadn't turned so badly against them in terms of climate on the Australian mainland, they'd probably still be around today. Um, in their time, they evolved a wide variety of skull shapes, uh, indicative of diversification of uh, our hunting strategies. We had ambush predators, we had fish eaters, we had dwarf mucosupines that we find, of course, in uh, the rivers of the heritage area. And tantalizingly, we have a number of features that suggest a more terrestrial, land-based hunting strategy, like the teeth of Kukana here, which are uh, uh, compressed and blade-like, a lot more like the goanna or indeed a, a large theropod dinosaur. So this is where I got my start, and I felt that if there's going to be a proper signal for locomotion, it's going to be in the postcrania, in the limbs, and in the pelvis. So I set myself getting about everything I could be, uh, get my hands on. And sure enough, one of the first things that popped up uh, were the humeri, that's the upper limb bone, uh, upper forelimb of one of the earliest mucosupines, Gambara, this guy here, uh, which tend to be a lot more columnar than the humeri that you see in modern crocodilians, which tend to be a lot more recurved, a lot more, a lot more sinusoidal. Uh, as more material behind up, it was pretty clear that this was obviously a defining trait of mucosupines, be they the enormous uh, humor that probably belong to the equally enormous Baru or these tiny little humor that we get out of Grizzly that probably belong to one of these dwarf uh, kinds. And in the Plyo Pleistocene, Plyo towards today, we see the development of rather unusual forms where the whole thing's begun to sort of develop into a big splayed out spatula. And I was very interested to analyze these because a lot of how the limb is habitually used in life and how it's built for full locomotion is reflected in its shape. Uh, I should also mention, of course, I've been working in this under our morphometrics expert, Dr. Laurel uh, Wilson, and we've been uh, uh, employing her method of uh, extracting the outlines of limb bone shafts to quickly walk you through, uh, starting with the models that we get from CT uh, scans. Uh, we do an alignment process that makes sure that all the models have the same common zero point and are all aligned together, uh, 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 which is important. So when we take our virtual uh, cross sections, we want to make sure that they're all identical so that we can take that common zero point, project radiance, and that gives us the important data that we can compare. Uh, so we started with some classical measures of shape. Now, the only thing you need to know about maths here is the bigger the number, the more resistant to bending along the x, the y, and then combines them together into a measure of resistance against twisting called j. Uh, and the main thing is we got results not too dissimilar to what's been reported in uh, crocodiles and alligators. One difference always being around J, this, this little measure of twisting, uh, which was the first suggestion that there was a subtle shape difference in the mucus supine set uh, uh, that wasn't turning up. The problem with these uh, uh, kind of measures is that they're very bulk. You could, have, you could see on the little diagram, you could have roughly the same X or Y, and you have a lot of ability to have a, a, a lot of different shape around that, uh, around that proportion. And sure enough, if we stick it into a principle component analysis, which of course is a way of telling us what's the biggest variation of shape between a bunch of shapes, we get the carbon freshwater crocs in our sample separating out quite nicely from the mucus supines uh, with a more rounded shape of the shaft versus a more elliptical shape. Uh, and we tend to see the mucus supines themselves beginning to separate out, and there's a temporal pattern to this separation. You have the earlier mucus supines uh, overlapping with modern crocodiles with a more rounded shape, and then diverging one way in the Oligomycene, and then diverging basically another way in the later Pleistocene. So 
uh, we have a shape difference and it would seem to be varying in time with the evolution of other aspects of their, of, of their um, ecology. So is there a more in-depth way that we can tell uh, how these limbs acted during the measurement? This we've got finite element analysis, which uh, is a technique that's been around since the 19th century, but you really didn't cute it to actually even try it. And it's a way of estimating internal stresses of complex objects by breaking them down into millions of tiny smaller objects, in our case, uh, uh, tetrahedral pyramids. Uh, these are a lot easier to calculate the inputs and outputs of. Uh, so what we did, we took our models and we strung them up with artificial muscles to simulate both the crocodilian sprawl, where the croc holds the limb out to the side and tends to employ when they're moving in and out of water, versus the high walk, where they hold the limbs under the body, like a mammal or bird, and they tend to uh, employ when they're moving about over land. Uh, we let it run for the peak of the step cycle, and assuming everything solves, we get nice colourful uh, stress diagrams. Basically, uh, reds are high stress, blues are low stress. And the first thing we immediately see is that more columnar mucosuchi humeri tend to produce far lower stresses overall, uh, especially these weird spatula ones, which tend to produce really low stresses. There are, of course, exceptions, be it particularly. Uh, the civil, uh, the, these humeri that belong to the dwarf uh, mucosuchi, and while there's always a slight increase in stress from sprawl to the high wall, it's usually an order of magnitude lower in the mucosuchi ones than in the one freshwater crops. Now we get an explanation for this if we split the, uh, uh, the stress into their components. That is the, uh, the compressive versus the tensile stress. The bit, the difference between the bone being squished together versus pulled apart. Uh, and we see whenever there's a curve, uh, we get a pattern of essentially a compressive stress on one side and an equal opposite tensile stress on the other side. And uh, when uh, the more columnar shapes don't do that, there's just an increase in compression without that equal and opposite reaction. Uh, so obviously the, fir the first thing we can say obviously is that these columnar mucosuchi would seem to be far more conductive to the high walk, but it raises the issue of uh, if it's so detrimental to, uh, uh, in, term, in terms of the generative stress, why is the curvature evolving at all? Indeed, why does curvature seem to evolve in a different way in these dwarf mucus of right? so-called curvature paradox? Uh, and there are a number of theories uh, in biomechanics for why this is, and they can help explain some of this. One, of course, is the predictability hypothesis. The thing you'll notice with the modern freshwater crop here is that the neutral axis in green doesn't vary no matter what, uh, not what, what orientation the limit assumes. Uh, so long as you basically reinforce these uh, areas of high stress, you've got that core of, of neutral, uh, uh, neutral, neutral stress that, that basically uh, uh, man maintains it no matter what orientation. So essentially it probably has something to do with their ability to variegate. The problem with the supine humor is that the stresses are far more variably distributed. So the chance of, of fracture is also more variably distributed. Of course, the stresses are much lower. Um, this, of course, leads in to another idea that could explain what's happening in the dwarf mucosuchi, uh, which is the so-called pre-buckled strut hypothesis. These bear a very striking resemblance to what we see in one of Konamas. Now, this is admittedly a picture of alpacas, but it shows you the environment that their humeri have actually adapted to. Uh, in order to get between these little mountain pastures, they've got to engage in a lot of climbing. And the act of climbing basically uh, exerts a very distinct pull on the humor. So their humor have evolved a essentially a curve in the opposite direction that cancels it out. Uh, and when we look at the environment that these are the dwarf mucus of plants were in at Riversley, closed forests with a lot of hilly terrain between them and very disparate sources of water, we see something very similar. In order to get between them, they probably may have had to engage in a lot of climbing over rough terrain. So this may be an adapt an adaptation to climbing. And of course. We can't mention climbing in these dwarf mucosuchi kinds and mention a rather infamous theory that they were arboreal. Uh, yes, indeed, the drop crocs. Uh, now, while this does uh, support it to a degree, it's probably not nearly as spectacular as you, as you uh, think, rather than gallivanting about in the canopy. What it opens up is the ability to utilize the boles of trees, much like we see cheetahs in the African savannah today, that use them as refuges against their much more larger, aggressive lean and kin. Uh, finally, of course, we have those weird displayed out spatula humerite. These are beginning to act a lot like the humerite of burrowing animals. And this 
isn't nearly out there as you might think with crocodiles, but of course, modern crocodiles engage in various digging behaviors. We see American alligators in the Everglades, they dig out wallows, which are uh, filled, uh, filled with water so that they can basically wait out dry spells. And uh, we've seen uh, reports of salt and, uh, so, sorry, freshwater and nard crocodiles exploiting abscesses and riverbanks for a relatively similar idea. Remember, this is the period in Australia where aridity is beginning to set in. Uh, so this may very well be, have been the last minute adaptation to try to, to, try, to try and uh, uh, adapt to this, but of course one that obviously didn't work. Uh, so just thanking everyone. And Opportunity to have a look at uh, Yeah, that, that, that's a the thing. They, they are, um, they're somewhat different, uh, 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 but um, uh, with, with regards to uh, whether or not uh, Mikasuka Irons directly aim to go out and, uh, and any of the other rounds, I mean, it's, it's, it's in, as, as point I, I didn't want to be drawn to this when I was writing my PhD because we don't really have a good idea of when the goannas actually came in to Australia. I, all indications would be that it was fairly early uh, because basically you've got, you've got a fossil record in Indonesia and Papua New Guinea fairly early on and you have basically a, a diversification event in, the, in their genome that really would suggest they got into here quite early. Uh, um, but yes, no, I, have, I, haven't, I haven't quite uh, uh, gotten to the comparative stage yet between this and, and uh, uh, many things. It's mo mostly it's, it's been a matter of try trying to just just have a, um, a for, for the, you know, you falsify the null hypothesis that they were just straight up st st standard semi-aquatic predators. And obviously, the, the, there's a big there is a big difference here. And I think I think they're being evolved to very, uh, uh, their, their limbs are being used in very different ways. This is the uh, way you're describing the, the dwarf, um, like mm. trees to say it, like, mm. it just sounds like an interesting thing to compare. Well, exactly. I've been, I've been I've been I've been trying to actually uh, figure out essentially essentially what what we're uh, what, what were the niches that were beginning to evolve here? I mean, so certainly um, it seems like an extension of what, of course, what we see in other crocodile communities that go that are able to go on long enough. You, you begin to see the same particular forms uh, coming out. There's a good question as to whether or not it's th this is a reaction to anything uh, in the Australian environment. I know, I know some people have not been super duper happy with the suggestion that are, that. Are, you know, uh, percent, uh, 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 placental mammals are adverse to the theory mammals are, you know, lightweight or whatnot. I don't think so either, uh, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite certain the same, the same niches were, 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 were in play. And there might, there might be, you know, what you might think of as a stochastic process where, or a chaotic process where the start of the, the, how, how an ecosystem starts with the foundational elements might change how, how it ultimately develops. But I think, I think very much this is a pattern in crocs that tends to occur, and it may just be a matter of essentially time uh, as, as to see what, what, what forms begin to come out. And eventually you do start to see, mainly because I suspect you can really have only one big king croc that, that occupies that main semi-aquatic ambush predator. It's a very lucrative niche and the problem is it's a very well defended niche and so everyone has to basically work on that.